Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us tonight. I'd like to begin by honoring and acknowledging that we live, work, and play on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Siksika, the Gainai, the Pekani, the Tutstina, the Stony Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nations, Region 3, and all the people who work, who make their homes in here in Treaty 7. We also acknowledge our immediate proximity to the Bow River, a site that resonates with us all today and with Indigenous populations for thousands of years. Additionally, our curators today join us from Toronto and Oakville, so we will also acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto was covered by Treaty 13 Agreement with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. Finally, we acknowledge that Oakville is situated on Treaty Number 14 and Treaty Number 22 lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional territory of the Huron Wendat and the Haudenosaunee. Oakville is currently home to many different First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We would like to extend a warm welcome to our curators the, of the further apart things seem, Shannon Anderson and Jay Wilson. Shannon Anderson is an independent curator and writer based in Oakville, Ontario. And Jay Wilson is an independent curator, artist, designer, and educator based in Toronto, Ontario. Their first co-curated project, the Closer Things Are was a group exhibition focused on artworks that examine the space between similarity and difference, arising from intense observation and consideration. An exploration of nearness and proximity, the exhibition brought together the work of 10 artists from across Canada, including Kathleen Hearn, Eve K. Tremblay, Laura Latinsky, Mike Alexier, Dave Dimont, Rula Parthenou, Rhonda Wepler, and Trevor Mahofsky. Luke Painter, and Chris Klein. Independently curated and organized, it traveled to the University of Waterloo Art Gallery in Waterloo, Ontario, the Owens Art Gallery in Sackville, New Brunswick, St. Mary's University Art Gallery in Halifax, and the Southern Alberta Art Gallery in Lethbridge between 2017 and 2018. Anderson's curated exhi exhibitions have been shown at galleries across Canada, and she is currently the art curator for the Oakville Trafalgar Memorial Hospital. She also has written essays for publications produced by numerous art galleries and features articles for Canadian Art, C Magazine, Carousel, and I'm Amazing Amsterdam. She holds a specialist BA in art and art history with distinction from the University of Toronto and an MA in art history from Concordia University in Montreal. Wilson is a full-time professor of design in the art and art history program a joint program between the University Toronto Mississauga and Sheridan College. He has an honors degree in wildlife biology and statistics from the University of Guelph, a diploma from the Ontario College of Art and Design and an MFA from New York University. As an artist, Wilson has shown both locally and internationally and has received numerous creation, research and exhibition assistance grants. His design and art practices are a mix of conceptual considerations and play often full of seeds, spontaneity, and contradiction. That said, extended as a public program of the further apart things seem, the curators walk us through the genesis of this curatorial project and the factors that shaped the choice of work. They'll also elaborate on the relevance of the show today, especially within our current socio-political context. There will be time allotted for questions at the end, so please feel free to send those in the chat as they arise. And without further ado, welcome Shannon Anderson and Jay Wilson. Hi, yeah. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi. It's, uh, it's great to be here and, um, you know, slightly nerve wracking, but also awesome. Uh, thanks to Contemporary Calgary for everything. And um, I guess, uh, Shannon, maybe I'll, I'll just start the slideshow. Sounds good. All right. Just give me a second here. And voila, Perfect. let me see that. I can see it, I think we're good. Awesome, all right. 
So I don't know, maybe maybe I'll start, but um, our first show, as um, Aliyah said, was called The Closer Together Things Are. And uh, I don't know, Shannon, do, should we talk about how we met and how that, how that went? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I, so- I can begin there if you want or go for it. Okay, so uh, uh, Shannon is a graduate from the program that I teach in. And at Sheridan College, we had um, a thing that I started called Temporary Contemporary. So it was an initiative to um, commission different artists from all over, all over wherever, Canada, but mostly Ontario, uh, to bring a specific piece of art that was located at, uh, was located on the campus. And Shannon uh, came on board to help us curate that and so, uh, select who the artists were that we would commission. And then one day we were just kind of, I don't know, we just got talking and I, I, uh, I think I was saying, oh yeah, I've been thinking about this idea, we had this idea about, uh, what was the term we used? Some, um, light awayness or yeah, nearness slight, and awayness. Yeah, and I, was, I don't know, we just got talking about it as we do, we're talking about art all the time. And uh, then, uh, I don't know, I said like, I don't know, do you wanna help me with this? Cause I don't know what I'm doing. So Shannon's a more seasoned curator, so uh, I would I really welcome her input on that. So um, yeah, we had a lot a great... of really good conversations trying to figure out what that could be. You had some ideas of different artists that were interesting to you, and then I started thinking about you know responding. It was a bit of a I don't know if it was a call and response, but we definitely kicked around some different ideas and slowly started shaping this project. And there was gaps in between, you know, we would pick it up again. And I think, you know, one of us would kind of go, yeah, you know, leave it for a while to get busy. The other one would sort of say, hello, like, let's keep talking about this. So exactly. it, took, it took like, it took a while, it probably took about four or five years from like the initial conversation to actually having the, you know, having the show open um, mm. its first gallery space in uh, University of Waterloo Art Gallery. So it was, we stuck with it, I guess. And it, it was, uh, it ended up turning into, you know, something that we were really, got really excited about and really proud of. We were able to bring it to different venues across across Canada. Um, we were able to travel to the venues and, you know, be there and do talks with the audiences, all the things that you hope to be able to do with a, a touring exhibition. And, and I think we learned along the way that we work well together as a, as a curatorial team, you know, we're kind of new to it and those things can sometimes you know, go sideways and not work out. But I think for us, like the more we work together, I'm going to speak for you, Jay. I think the more like we work together, the more we realize that we actually complemented each other quite well. And, and you know, our tastes weren't always the same. Like we didn't have the same interests, but when we, when our interests did kind of coalesce and we both were excited about, uh, you know, a particular artwork that we'd seen or something that we were, you know, had gone to an exhibition together and got really excited about something that was, it was it was it was great like when you found those moments of the, of the things that got us both excited and that's so that was the space that we just started operating in to develop exhibitions and new ideas and we realized you know as this one came together that we could keep working on, on things and kind of mm -hmm. yeah and one of the perks too is that when you're curating you get to travel you get to I, I don't know why I never really thought about this before but you get to travel to these great places I love going to art galleries anyway so it's a, very awesome to be able to you know actually go to a show and put together something that you're seeing in your head mm -hmm. uh, another perk is to go to studio visits and meet all these artists it's been such a great experience I just want to talk a little bit about the slide that's up right now that's kind of our invitation that we used and it's um the images from a uh, parent trap, uh, a movie where there's, I can't, who's the uh, actor? Do you remember? I can't remember who that actor is, but she plays the same role twice. She's famous. I just can't remember. <laughs> and uh, the artist, uh, Michael Lexer, was really into this kind of, um, this doubling thing, uh, especially since we were talking about uh, this theme of things being closer together. But I, I'd also like to point out that if you look at the list of artist names in the top corner, you'll see that they're not in alphabetical order. And that's because Shannon and I had this idea um, when we were arranging the show, one of our curatorial, curatorial premises was that we wanted to sort of always list the artists in, um, in a way that was um, P 
peopled and figurative on one side when we're thinking about nearness or similarity. And on the other end of the spectrum, it would be more um, maybe surfacy and abstract. So we always had this, this, this uh, I guess it's like a timeline. And we, we always put the artists on that timeline. And I mean, I'm calling it a timeline, but it's actually like a, I don't know what you call it, some kind of continuum. So uh, we would always think of the artists in that order, not necessarily the way they're hung in the gallery, but um, basically based on that premise of being sort of figurative on one end, abstract on the other end. So the, the next slide, uh, I sort of picked a slide of the, the two artists on either side. So that's Kathleen Hearn on the left-hand side in working on installing her video. So that's a work where she hires amateur actors and they, um, they replicate, I think it was Dazed and Confused, uh, a movie from back in the day. Uh, and so we were really interested in that um, similitude or whatever that, you know, uh, acting out something, um, but seeing the cracks in their lack of acting experience. And on the right-hand side, this is the work of Rula Parthenu, and uh, she builds very, um, very accurate uh, decoys or uh, versions of things that we see in the world, but slightly tweaked. So they all became, they're sort of like the other end of the spectrum. So the kind of um, abstract or sort of um, more about a veneerism or something like that. Some very formal qualities that we started exploring. Yeah. Around, yeah. And this is an installation shot from the first venue at the University of Waterloo Art Gallery. So you can see Rhonda Wepler and Trevor Mahofsky's pieces sort of in the, in the middle in the foreground. Um, they had this music of chance piece that was made out of cast, uh, hand cast sort of uh, aluminum foil that went along the, the floor, uh, various objects. And then they had another uh, veneer piece, I think that's called Visitation. I'm gonna, yeah. it's been a while, my memory's a little fuzzy, but yeah. also like Visitation. dealing with veneerism, like you were, you were saying before, like that sort of surface layer of things. So um, really looking at real, you know, working from objects like fences, but if you, we love this piece, we had both seen it in a different gallery and, and you know, that amazement as you kind of go around the back and you see that it's, um, it's just a veneer, it's just a very thin veneer, it's not, the fence is super fragile and delicate. Um, so their work kind of occupied, I guess, you kind of consider like the center ground of, of the, the premise of the show. And then in the background, um, Eve Tremblay's pieces, you can see that the two larger, the sort of pairing of larger ones, and then also way in the background, uh, there's some Luke Painter pieces as well. Um, yeah, I love this, this space. We'll actually be, um, maybe I'm jumping ahead a bit, but the show that's on at Contemporary Calgary now um, will actually be going to the University of Waterloo Art Gallery in the fall, which is exciting for us to kind of have the other bookend of the show over there. Right, so we took we took that premise, the uh, this this timeline or continuum, and we um, designed a catalog around it. So some interesting things happen. This might be interesting for artists that are tuning in or to think about curatorial things, but uh, in a curatorial way. But uh, we ended up talking to one of the artists, which was Chris Klein, and he was he sent us some images. Um, and they were pictures of, through his cell phone, looking up at the sun through his hand. And in that picture, the, it's out of focus, but you see, you see this orange color and a pink color. And so that actually translated to the stock color that we chose for the um, catalog. And when the cover comes off, in that, as you can see in that video, uh, there's a poster inside. So the poster, we asked all the artists to, or, and all the directors of all the galleries to give us anything they thought of that, you know, was closer together or anything they thought that, um, how they would respond to that theme. So although it's blurry because it's the end of the video, um, that's the poster that comes off the, the catalog and you, you, you get to see that's a little insider knowledge or a little bit of insight. There's the picture actually, the blurry picture of the, through his hand where you can see those colors where the book, the orange and the pink come together. Throughout the catalog, I just do. <laughs> oh yeah, yay! Yeah. And also all the way through the catalog, um, there is this, if you can see my little picture there, there's a little timeline 
it goes all the way through. So it, it, we constantly reiterated that location of the artist in relation to one another, which is, I don't know, kind of interesting. And then we decided to keep going and curate some more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very, so, very funny, right? Yeah, yeah. So we, we you know, as, as the other show wrapped up, you know, we were still doing studio visits and we were, we were interested in continuing this curatorial um, you know, work on and trying to develop another project. So I think it just started out generally as doing studio visits without really being certain about where we were going in the process. Um, so it took a little while to, to, to develop things. Uh, we did, you know, we, we, yeah, we had some, you know, artists that we were thinking about. This is one of Raymond Boisjoli's works. We were to do a visit with David Merritt, like different, just sort of trying to get the juices flowing and thinking about what what could work for this project. And uh, I don't know if you want to say anything about these images. Well, I just, I thought, uh, oops, sorry, I think we're getting a little feedback there. I can hear, but anyway, uh, what's interesting about these photos for me is that, and this process takes so many years that um, we had a working title. It wasn't called The Further Apart Things Seen. Uh, we were just we were just doing studio visits, so it's interesting that this these these photos for me is uh, none of these artists are in the show. So th these are all these different. It's not that the work wasn't good or was bad or anything like that. It's just that as the as the curatorial process goes along, as we see and visit more artists, it's funny how um, the show reveals itself through conversation and. Um, work that really sticks with us. And then you find you start getting um, work that grounds the show. Yeah, I think something that I've always been really cognizant of as a curator is to work, develop a show from the artwork. And I know that sounds kind of logical, but I find, you know, I'm, I'm really not a fan of, you know, developing a concept really clearly and then finding artists to illustrate my curatorial concept. But, and early on, I had um, in a talk, I always remember an artist said, I hate curators who use artists like paint, which meant like illustrate your concept. And I thought, I'm never going to do that because I get that. Like, I understand that that's, you know, I, I'd like, I always want to put the artist first. And I think we, we both had that sensibility that we wanted our curatorial ideas driven by the work that we're out seeing and the artists we're interacting with. It takes a little longer sometimes to figure out where your thesis is going, but then I think it's a thesis at the end of the day that we can really defend to ourselves and that we can feel um, feel strongly about because it's grounded in the work, it's always there. So these are um, some early studio visits uh, that we did with Barbara Hobot, whose work is in the exhibition. And Barbara, just as an aside, was actually an installer. She's an artist, installer, you know, uh, as many artists do, working in, in different, different, uh, different ways. And so we knew her, I knew her work already. And then um, we got to work with her as a person, got to know her a little bit on installing the Closer Together Things Are in Waterloo. Uh, and then soon after that, we thought we should get, you know, let's, let's spend some time seeing her work and, and have some initial conversations and that was super fruitful. So I would say at the beginning of the show for us and, and laid a foundation for what we would felt really good about growing a project around. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. interesting to know that we met Barbara through that first, um, the first exhibition and I don't know, we kind of became friends. It was really interesting to go back to the studio and see the development. Uh, we went to her show at, uh, is this, this is Forest City? Forest City Gallery. So uh, you'll see the blue piece, the Celestial Dew Trap on the right in the show. The other works were not really included because Barb, Barbara kept um, developing her work. And as we were in discussion with her, we kind of thought, you know, there's certain things that are kind of resonating. And then it really did become kind of the pivot. I've kind of put these slides in order of uh, actual actual order of how we did the studio visits to give you an idea of maybe how the show was shaped. Mm. And this is the work of Atmos Bosdroff. So uh, he's a Toronto artist. He's doing his master's. Uh, we visited him in his second last year, 
second last year of his master's, maybe last year. I don't think he was working on his thesis at this point, but um, this is the work in his studio at OCAD U. So it's, you know, it's a little provisional, the floors aren't great, um, but he had these ideas of these ramps. He has um, a disability, he walks with a cane and he has um, leg braces. So he uh, is addressing his visibility in the world, the way he sees the world, the way, he's, the way he's sometimes othered by the world. Uh, and these are early um, studio shots. So on the left are tips from his cane that he cast um, on a kind of crappy <laughs> plinth, very typical of OCAD U, I think sometimes, or student, you know, what, what they can use. But on the right, you'll see they're cast in out of wax and crayons. And on the right, you can see the drawings that he made with his cane on the ground. Uh, uh, we always thought those were really, enigmatic and interesting. They didn't make it into the show strangely, but um, it's interesting to see that work. As well, he had designed, there's a whole series of Whitechapel uh, art books. Anyone who's in art school probably knows these books. Uh, they're called like performance art. There's one called craft and design. There's a whole series of them. So, but there isn't an accessibility one. So Atnes mocked up his own version of that. The type solution on the front is very, it's very similar. Like it goes through all the different versions of that. And uh, he also had a, what he's calling an accessibility reader 1.0.1 on the, on the right, which is a, uh, a mock-up and he's using someone else's artist, another artist that he knew of that used ramps in their work. This is a, a charcoal version of one of his cane tips. And just to show you some other work that we didn't include, uh, this was, I just texted him because I couldn't remember what this was called or what this was about on the top left. He said it was a, uh, uh, it was a research project, mind map into a box die cut. That was a actually distinct project. And the bottom, uh, I really love these things on the bottom. He probably doesn't love them, but uh, when he, when you wear a brace on your leg and you're walking all the time, the wear and tear from that brace, uh, it, it breaks it down, it actually falls apart. So he has to duct tape this brace to his legs all the time. And um, these are, this is the duct tape that wears out as well. He cuts that off and he was sort of had that laying around and was kind of thinking about what that could maybe turn into. And lastly, I'll just show this piece. This is across the street in the Grange in Toronto, if anyone knows where OCADU is. So this was a project he did in collaboration with another student he was working with. It's, it was called um, Forever Teal, I mm -hmm. think. It was, I can't remember what it was about that color, but he, he built this ramp out of um, cardboard, painted it blue. And he also has a latex allergy. So he was working on this piece here. I don't know if you can see my cursor with the balloon with beadwork around the, um, the mouthpiece of it. And the still in the top right is a video of him kind of wrestling in the wind with uh, transporting this ramp and what it's like for him to try and carry works because he always has a cane in one hand and um, his mobility, you know, it's tricky for him sometimes. So, um, you know, it's interesting for us as uh, curators because we actually kind of watched him go through this process and start talking about his disability in a way that he hadn't before, so. Yeah, I think it's, it's, I like seeing these shots again after so long because you realize like some, so when you actually, we get to the images from the installation, some of this will look familiar. There's elements that we ended up including, you know, some of the cast from the cane tips, but there's plenty of things that we, we didn't, right? As Atnes's practice grew, as all of the practices, our practices grew that we initially had studio visits with, what we ended up, there's definitely a transition period from those first bit studio visits. And we really wanted to keep the, the content of the show, you know, evolving um, as, as their practices grew as well, so that we could keep things sort of timely in the moment. And, you know, this is probably about where we started going <laughs> to learning about Zoom because everything <laughs> shut down and we had this show that we had half developed and all of a sudden we couldn't go anywhere. We really, we really enjoy our road trips and going to do studio visits. We, we actually do a lot of our planning work in the car because we're talking about what we've seen we start generating ideas it's a really we found it a really important space I think we were even going to call ourselves like road trip at one point 
as our as our collective name, but we couldn't do that anymore. Um, so this was sort of like the breaks went on, but we just sort of kept working on things. We were really fortunate um, to receive a research grant from the Ontario Arts Council. And so we, you know, kind of dug into our research and started doing more studio visits, started, you know, expanding the premise of the show a bit, um, just taking a little more time with it and reflecting on, you know, the circumstances and, um, you know, the protests that, that were happening, just the, the social climate in general and thinking, okay, how does this project make sense in where we're at right now with all of these changes? And um, I think we got got kind of lucky that it still it resonated and it started to um you know it started to resonate in new and deeper ways for us so um, we were able to kind of keep moving along the trajectory that we'd started with the project so this is uh adriana kuiper and, and ryan Suter, uh who uh, are in the exhibition and this is one of our, our studio visits we had our research grant was supposed to allow us to go travel out east to go spend time in their studio and meet with them in Sackville, New Brunswick. But this was the, the platform that we needed to use anyway. And, you know, we were still able to see inside their studios, albeit from a distance, um, and, and have these conversations about, um, you know, how it, about their work in general and also how it was uh, responding to the, the current situation and, and how they felt about these, this body of work that we were super excited about and are still excited about um, dealing with silencing and muffling, um, you know, the, the attempt to make sound, having objects that um, represent the body in them without actually having any figure, figures present and what that would mean. And we also, we also met them when we were doing the Closer Together things are, we met them um, at Mount A University. We did a studio visit with Adriana. And the interesting thing was she, uh, she had shown us all a body of work and right at the very end, she said, oh, and I'm also working on these other things. And Shannon and I were like, well, what are they? And she said, well, these quilts. And she showed us these quilts and we were both like, wow, these quilts are super beautiful. And she was like, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing with them. Um, I don't know, I'm just making them because I feel like I need to make something, which is a very artist preoccupation. Um, so we, we kept talking to her about these, uh, these quilts. We met Ryan, they worked together and uh, it's really interesting the way it bloomed. So you'll notice a couple things. I put these particular studio shots in because of the chair on the left, which is in their studio. Hmm. Um, and in this shot here, um, the piece on the right is really interesting because I remember, I remember seeing that piece and Adriana was like, yeah, I'm kind of doing this. And, um, the video work on the left and the photography kind of documentation on the top, all of that we were really interested in. So it, it kind of, uh, it took us, I don't know, we just, we just kept on about that. Yeah, I'd say not a lot changed in terms of their representation in the show from the beginning. It was always about these, these quilt installations just, you know, mm. were really exciting and that just didn't change. It just was the type, it, it was, we just kind of left it to them in a way and how they wanted to evolve the series and when it got to the point of installation what they where they were at in that series and what they wanted to show so this is uh cuisine van Hoovelen and his connection was during that temporary contemporary thing i was talking to you about share at sheridan in the fifth iteration of it i think he was the artist that got selected so we got to know him uh, he's a very interesting soft-spoken gentle person. Um, and so we started with um, more Zoom Zoom calls with him. And uh, yeah, we're not, we look kind of sad there, Shannon. But... <laughs> we do. We were, we had a different, <laughs> we were just being contemplative at the time. It was a good studio <laughs> visit. They were always. Yeah, that's my, that's my listening face, I guess. Yeah. My taking um, notes face. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> do you want to talk about this work at all or? Sure, yeah, so so the the one slide of the the mylar piece um, is in is in the gallery uh, space, and we first saw it sort of in his studio adhered to the wall, not um, the way it's intentionally shown, which is is uh, filled with aluminum so that it floats like a balloon. Uh, it's based on a, a seal skin seal skin form. And then the other one is uh, I think it's is it a soapstone version of the Humatic? 
Is it? I think I'm it's sure. stone. Anyway, I'm not sure if it's marble or not. I thought it was marble. Yeah, it's a that much could be heavier silk. material, and we had seen it um, at the uh, gallery that we had gone to visit of a solo show when he had a solo show that was touring at one point, and. Um, yeah, we ended up not ultimately including that one in, in the work. It's a different homotic piece. But again, as like Cuisine's work was evolving too, we wanted to be responsive to where he was at and what he was excited about showing. So he had already shown a number of pieces through it, through a different solo show. So um, by the time our show was starting to come uh, to happen, he was already kind of on to other things. But, you know, with all of these artists, so much of their work, uh, was resonating with the theme just as as their interest in work as a practice. So whatever was happening in, at their practice in the moment may would fit and tend to make sense. I mean, there was obviously some curatorial assessments along the way too, like some things would be working more than others, but, um, and there's variations on these two pieces in the exhibition as well. Uh, one is an outdoor, uh, outdoor sculpture piece um, of these char stakes, and there's a different version of those uh, uses as, as a different material in, in the further part thing scene. And then on the other uh, side is a, a sleeping sleeping sled dog. And um, just sort of, just as we were about to, to open the exhibition, you've been talking about wanting to make these, and this is actually just a, a public art proposal that hasn't been realized yet, but he was, um, we got really excited about the sculptural uh, possibilities, so he actually made um, a version of it uh, for for the exhibition, which is really stunning. I thought uh, for view for viewers, it might be interesting to see uh, an early floor plan of the way we set the show up. So that's the four artists. The entrance is here, if you can see my cursor. Um, and you can see like uh, we had Atnes's work here, Adriana and Ryan's work here. Um, this is Barb's work up in here. It's funny, eh? It's so different. <laughs> I know, I know. Cuisine's work here. And then we were going to put a sound wow. piece in here. This piece uh, is of Atlas. Is we walk with a cane. So when you're with him, you become very aware of this tick, tick, tick noise. Um, so he, he had recorded that and that was a sound piece that he really liked. And this is a narrow part of the hallway. So we thought this would be really cool if it was like dark in there with a little spotlight and he'd walk in and hear this tick and then walk past it which I actually still love that idea, but there you go. It's so funny, um, only Adrienne and Ryan's pieces are where they were, where we- Yeah, it's true, it's right? true, right? <laughs> they're the, yeah. like they're the constants to see in the show for some reason, right? Everything else yeah, is yeah. around. <laughs> this, is, this is a picture of Mona Phillip who worked, uh, worked at the Koffler Gallery. And we, Shannon, I wanted to put this slide in because she's so awesome. She took us on right at the beginning, uh, championed us, the great thing about her and the thing I really learned from Mona is that she fosters talent. Like she would meet us and um, discuss our project. And she actually said to Shannon, she pushed us. She goes, you know, you should make your show more political. And both Shannon and I were kind of like, well, we don't necessarily think that way. So we kind of went away, but then we sort of talked about it to ourselves and we thought about what a challenge that would be. Like, what would our version of a political show look like? And that sounds kind of like, I don't want that to sound dismissive because we took it very seriously. And she really, uh, I don't know, I, I learned a lot from her about I think, um, I think way, ways some, we could push ourselves. Yeah, I think she saw some, the potential for the show to go a bit deeper. And, you know, she's kind of believed in us to, to push it further. <laughs> and we for did, sure. right? And so we ended up being really happy with with where we landed. And then um, and she was happy too, right? It worked out really well. I'm happier in this slide and you're medium happy in this slide. <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, uh, so at one point we just did a deep dive. We just started researching. This was the summer. And um, I did this thing at one point where I went to, I just, I just started researching and looking at different galleries all over the country, but mostly in Vancouver, because I was thinking, you know, this is another curatorial thing, like, oh, it'd be great. I want to kind of go out west. So maybe we'll look out west for artists that we don't know or or we barely heard about or were new to us. So um, I looked up every single gallery and the last two or three shows they did and looked at every single artist's work. And then I twigged on the work of Anna Binta Diallo, 
Um, she was living in Montreal at the time, uh, but she was born in St. Boniface, um, New, sorry, Manitoba. And this is her work. Um, as soon as we saw this, I mean, I, I'm a designer, so it's got kind of a graphic sensibility about it. Uh, but there was this idea of the diaspora and the separation of uh, elements and collage, I think really struck a chord with Shannon and I. So we only met Anna um, online, only through Zoom. We, we hadn't, the COVID was like thick and heavy right here. So we, um, yeah, we just, we would only meet her during Zoom calls. She was generous enough to show us her process. So she's working in Illustrator here. You can see this is August 20th. That's my personal calendar <laughs> up in the corner. Uh, but you know, you can see the way she, she was talking to us about how she puts the images together and uh, the way she thinks about them in collage and um, her color palette, very interesting. The whole process is really quite fascinating. Uh, and it turns out I actually hired her at my school to teach design. She was a fantastic, um, fantastic colleague. This is another shot of her assembling some of the work and showing us some of her ideas. Yeah, her work was really, really exciting for us um, as an addition to, you know, as we were developing the project during COVID um, and we had a bit more time to, to bring in some additional artists. Um, we really loved the way her approach to the sort of remix that she calls remix approach to culture, like having come from all these different backgrounds, you know, the French culture of St. Boniface, um, you know, being born in Senegal and, and reconciling all these different senses of her own identity, um, things that, you know, it's just that whole exploration of identity through bringing the dis what you see as the disparate parts of you together um, was something we hadn't thought initially about, but it really helped to enrich the, the concept for us and, and build the foundation further. And then and then um, I think my deep dive <laughs> came out with Brendan Lee Sadish Tang. And uh, he was also another artist that we we uh, knew learned about his work through uh, online research and had some ideas about maybe what could resonate with the exhibition. And then we you know, had a studio visit. So this is the Ready Player One was a video piece that we thought could be really exciting for the project. And then we ended up doing a studio visit with him and uh, saw what he was in the middle of working on in his studio right there. And, and that, so that was sort of that, a big moment for us like, oh, wait a minute, you're doing all, you're doing this project? What's going on in your studio? You're building trucks and that with a watercolor paper. And um, so, you know, we, we ended up sort of shifting our focus to this body of work, which was, you know, newer for him and something that he was in the middle of developing, but um, resonated even deeper with the themes that we were thinking about and his explorations of uh, youth culture growing up in Nanaimo, BC and never feeling sort of part of that youth community. So looking at all those objects like the Ford F-150 and beer bottles and, and uh, trucker hats and sort of reconciling his own feelings about his exclusion from that community um, and trying to make peace with his own feelings uh, about it. And which we thought was a really, um, really beautiful project that resonated on a lot of, uh, a lot of levels for us. So we were really excited to, to have his, his work involved in this as well. Also a super nice person. And those are little, um, they're like this big. They're little models and he was hanging them on the wall. You can see the red one in the background over here. And on the right, uh, this is the full scale model of the Ford 150 that he's actually working on. He was talking to us about what he was going to do and it turned into something that looked like this. So this uh, became a bit of a anchor in the show as well. Um, and it's a, a full size Ford 150 made out of watercolor paper and then lit below so that it's, um, evoking, well, it evo evokes like, uh, you know, like souped up cars and lighting features underneath, but mostly it evokes fire and an idea of um, offerings like, um, I mean, in, in his words, well, I'll paraphrase, but it's um, 
a Joss paper tradition where uh, burning uh, burning these models or paper or sculptures of um, uh, different objects is kind of a, a way of reconciling the past and the present, um, settling scores or being able to be at peace with whatever you need to be at peace with. So that's that's kind of leading up to the leading up to the show, I guess. And uh, so the next one, suddenly we jump to Calgary. <laughs> and this is in uh, October. Yeah, yeah, this is the first yeah. time we went. Yeah, and um, so Shannon and I uh, went to Contemporary Calgary because I'd never been there before. I've been to Calgary quite often, but not to the gallery. Uh, here's a visit with a mask to the show before our show that was um, in the space that you're going to see. It's a funny, I, I don't know, for people who don't know Contemporary Calgary, it's a, used to be a planetarium. It's a very excellent space really interesting for us as curators because it it's not a box usually in our experience you know you're, you're always putting especially a group show you sort of put everything in a box and you can see other work in the distance or you know you have to really think about the way the work interacts but but because because of this gallery which is called the ring gallery it goes around the outside of the planetarium it's almost like the guggenheim you you have a real narrative sense as you walk through it or a sequential experience of art. So you, you can kind of uh, compartmentalize everything, which I found really, it wasn't something I was expecting. It was really, really fascinating. Uh, here's us also <laughs> discussing in front of it a James like Carlos. I love this one because it looks like we're arguing, but we're not. <laughs> it looks like you're doing um, shadow things on the wall. Yeah, or that. <laughs> you're doing a shark. Um, yeah, right, no, it's, so it's, is... a, it's it was we've never curated for a space like that before, and I well, I don't think there really are many spaces like that, like you're saying. Um, but it really like you don't have a lot of choices as a as a viewer of where to go, right? You just follow the circle. Like really, mm. it's like all we can control is do you go left when you turn in or right when you go in, and even that, like most people, you know, go in a clockwise direction. So you know, you, you really have an opportunity to shape the viewer's experience, like from one piece to the next, because your sight lines are, you know, there's not a lot of choice, right? You're going to see things as you see things. And that was pretty exciting for us too, because as we started to lay out think, uh, you know, the works in sequence, we could look across and, and, and see relationships in the way that we would uh, install works from one thing to the other. So it was a much more focused kind of installation than we've done before. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is this is the show that uh, is on now. Um, you walk in this front space. Uh, here's the updated floor plan. So you can see at the bottom now you come in here. Uh, Anna Benta Diallo's work is here. Um, Ryan and Adriana's is here. Atnes's work is here. The sound piece is now here. Brendan's work is in here. This is the truck. This is Barbara Hobart's work all along in here. Um, and this is Cuisine's work here, balloons, uh, sled, dog bollard. So we'll sort of take you through it. You can go online at the uh, Contemporary Calorie and Shannon and I have done a little video and um, we described this work, but we'll kind of go through here a little bit quickly so we can get to the Q and A. But it's interesting to see, I hope for you that you, when you look at the, imagery, you can see what kind of morphed into um, work in the show from what we saw. And I would say that a lot of the work, probably 50% of it is brand new and made for the show. So this is very interesting. And in the chat, I think Kate just put the uh, virtual tour. So thanks for that. So this is the work of Ant Anna Binta Diallo. Uh, she made, well, it's spectacular, <laughs> designed it perfectly for the space, uh, scaled everything perfectly included some um, Calgary references like the rancher here in particular. Um, and I guess we don't really need to talk so much about what the work's about necessarily because yeah. uh, of the video, but just to show you, and there's Anna, I think. Yeah. With a child in tow, um, just to give you an idea of the scale. And you can see a new body of work here um, this, uh, oh, I'm blanking on the name, 
the Almanac series with the, these round, roundels with the map imagery and sort of uh, nostalgia built in together. There's the rancher and this is the image that we used um, for the invitation. And here's the, what I would call rond rondels. And so this is walking counterclockwise. You're coming in the door and you're going up like we're at like, I don't know, seven to eight o'clock. Uh, Adriana Kuiper and Ryan Suter. So these are the works that ultimately um, we included in the exhibition. Uh, so there's a series of them and uh, Ryan was, uh, was uh, generous enough to actually come out and install. Um, you know, it's, it's a funny thing when you're putting up a show, you need to be there for the installation and the opening. And it was like, we would have probably had to live there for a few weeks to, to see the whole show go from, you know, beginning to end the installation period. So it was really great to have Brian be on site and, and be able to install the work and, and sort of give him the parameters of the space we were looking at and, and for him just to kind of run with it. And he did an amazing, amazing job installing those pieces there. And you know, realizing weird things that we hadn't even realized in the space, like, oh, the walls are angled, <laughs> right? We didn't realize quite the angle and how it would impact on some of the work. So I mean, even doing site visits and, and doing as much pre-planning as you can, it's, um, you know, still a challenge in that space to, to make some of these pieces work, but uh, he did a great job um, putting everything, pulling everything together. And, you know, there's a lovely sequence from one to the other in, in their section. There's the chair. There's the chair. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Atnes's work. So Atnes uh, accompanied us in, was it February? Yeah, February. Um, and went around Calgary documenting um, different ramps that were not installed properly and being misused and did a whole photographic series that um, are all around Calgary. And you can see at the bottom, the original ramp pieces that we looked at. Uh, but installed in a very different way. We always pictured them, uh, you know, facing the wall. And um, I think Ryan actually sort of put them sideways. <laughs> we were both like, oh, that looks so great. We're really happy with that. So thank you, Ryan. Um, here's just a close up of one of the photos. They're very beautiful, mounted on aluminum. Uh, and then you can see uh, straight in front of us there that there's the. These are, so this actually, this is on the left here. These are actual worn out cane tips. There's the crayon ones and there's the stack of books. Uh, the crayon ones look like this. Really, his work worked really beautifully in that space too because of just like the ramps and then you had this nice surprise with all the angles in uh, Temporary Calgary. It, 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 mm -hmm. it, uh, in a way we hadn't really planned, it worked really beautifully. And these were drawings he made using the uh, a charcoal cane tip uh, and you, like breaking it and using the cane to make the drawings. So these, and uh, we made sure as per his specifications, everything was low to the ground. Um, the plinths were low, um, just so everything was accessible to everybody as, as it should be. This is Brendan Lee Sadish Tang's installation. So in a less dark space, it's very interesting to show this work. Um, just a little detail of his initials and his birth date on the bottom of the license plate. Uh, these are truck nuts on the left made of paper and watercolor that were set on fire as is the uh, beer bottles, trucker hats in the foreground. This is a video that plays behind uh, the work and it plays in reverse and then goes forward. And it's one of, it's the red model that you saw in his studio. Um, and he set it on fire and it's called a reluctant offering. So we don't have to watch that because I want to make sure we get the Q&A, but it's cool. It, if I, uh, I wonder if I can scrub it forward for you. Yeah, the whole thing burns yeah, to pieces. Oh, sorry. Yeah, and then um, Barbara Hobot, kind of, we're kind of going full circle now here. Uh, so these are the works that ultimately were included in the exhibition. 
um, as her series of these fog catching nets um, that she went to research in, in Chile. She kept working with these materials and these mountain ranges and, and playing with um, space. We didn't really get a chance to talk about You'll have to go and watch our videos and see the show to learn about more about what the fog catching nets will do and also the panel discussion that will happen but i won't go into detail here but um you know just uh there's these pieces they're all kind of related along a similar theme there's some silk pieces on the wall as well um also dealing with these these two different mountain ranges that, that come together uh in a pairing of, of silk pieces Another one, and these so, were again like right at the end of, that we these came together. Yeah, brand brand new. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> and here you can see the angle. I love this slide because you can see the angle of the wall. You can see the celestial dew trap piece that uh, came from the Cold City Gallery show, uh, not installed on a blue wall but on a white wall, uh, and also the way the walls are slanted so that the photograph actually hangs out from the wall, I think it has a really, it's a super beautiful. The, the blue piece is um, a, a giant fridge magnet in, in essence, and it's uh, it holds the photograph against the steel. And this is Cousine's work right at the very end. Uh, so here we get to see how the um, Avatuck is installed. So these are the helium balloons uh, that the visitor walks through. This is uh, Hamatik, so that's the sled that's made out of packing pallets, and he's very interested in uh, uh, ideas of um, travel and locomotion, or um, you know, moving from place to place. So you can see the um, char stakes here and how they've changed materials. These were done right before; they're made out of styrofoam, so they act like packing peanuts, um, and they're shown in the box that they were shipped in on top of uh, Hamatik, and that's uh, a great shot of them. And in the distance, this is the, the one dog bollard that we got that he made out of cement and hydrocal, uh, a beautiful sentinel. It sort of turns its back on you when you come in. So we're hoping that it kind of directs you to go to the left and see Anna's work first. When you go around the front of it, you see the sleeping dog that's um, both guarding the entrance, but also, um, you know, resting. <laughs> so it's just, a, it's a very, a very uh, beautiful and emotional piece, I think. So that's kind of the, I know we kind of, we sort of, I think in the talk, we wanted to talk more about curation as, as opposed to the content because there will be a panel dis discussion coming up. And also there's a lot of um, sort of didactic video work on the Contemporary Calgary website. I'd just like to take an opportunity to thank the Ontario Arts Council for supporting Shannon's and my initiative. We're really fortunate we developed a website through this and uh, it helped us a lot with um, building the show. And huge thank you to Contemporary Calgary who have been so fantastic. I know everybody always says that, but seriously, like great experience, like totally amazing. Um, Jesse, who did all the photo documentation, Kate, who does all the marketing and um, basically holds our hands constantly and uh, has been great. Kanika for all our organization all the way through this thing. Uh, Aliyah for jumping in <laughs> and uh, helping us today and uh, being so great to work with. And of course, Ryan Doherty, uh, who supported our vision from the very, very beginning, like really jumped in right away. And uh, we, we owe him a, a lot of thanks. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Wonderful, that was excellent. Thank you so much for that, Shannon and Jay. That was really, really wonderful. Um, we do have a couple questions now that have come in from the audience. So uh, we'll go through those for the next 10-ish minutes. Um, first question, how did your curation of this project change or not change from your first co-curation project together? Hmm. Um, I think it changed in a lot of ways, I think. Uh... I think, as Jay said, like we we were trying to be more attuned with the social climate as as the show developed. We were, I think, um, not to say that that wasn't the case with the other show, but I think we were, you know, just looking at a different kind of curatorial premise. And I think that this project sort of elaborates. I mean, it's you know, there's there's definitely relationships. One is the close together things are. One is the further apart things seem. Their bookends in a way. 
but we didn't really plan it that way. It's just sort of the way things evolved. So there's there are similarities between them, but I do think um, I think we went we were able to go in a shift direction a little bit for this one. Also, COVID. Oh, okay. also COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, COVID, COVID was brutal, right? It just it just stopped everything in the middle of it. And I think everybody can, um, you know, obviously identify with that. But it was just, you know, for a year, nothing happened. And this, this you know, it was different, Shannon. The other project, uh, closer together, um, it was harder getting uh, venues, mm. if you, the way it worked. And then this one, right at the beginning, we got all the venues and we were like, wow, this is great. And then it stopped, which was very frustrating. But anyway, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, we have another question uh, from Trevor Mahofsky, actually. It says, you spoke, uh -oh. about, <laughs> you spoke about a curatorial process in which at one point you felt you needed to add artists and you visited the West Coast. You also mentioned artists you considered but did not include. How did you know when the show was complete? For example, did you edit because you felt like certain ideas had to be dealt with in a third show? Mm. Big question. Yeah, that's a great question because, you know, we're big fans. Certain things happen like uh, one of the artists we were really into um, and they just sort of didn't return our calls. Like sometimes there's things like that, like practical things, or just, you know, because there was, um, I don't know, they didn't feel like there was a simpatico or that they were that interested, which is every artist's right. Um, you know, then we lose interest. So that's one way. Other ways, I think, um, honestly, it's through this road trip, like talking about it all the time. <laughs> And thinking about this is an interesting addition, and um, the artists that I really, really loved suddenly didn't fit. And also, the show at the beginning was. Remember, can I say this, Shannon? It was about type. Very like we kind of yeah, yeah. Like we were going to call it. Don't you know? Don't hold this against us. But it was called. Um, what was it called? I can't remember. We had a really kind of lame oh, working yeah. title. Beyond Beyond Words or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'd never use that, but. We were thinking about <laughs> thinking about type and it was kind of our working title. And then it, I don't know, just like Shannon said, going through the studio visits, um, it's like you get emotionally invested in some of the practices, even work that I wasn't even initially interested. Some work that I was really initially interested in went by the wayside. And then other work that I wasn't really into at the beginning um, through our discussions, I suddenly started to really gravitate to it and also with working in a collaboration and Trevor, you'll know this with working with Rhonda, um, we influence each other. Like I can, I can remember very specific times of Shannon saying like, you know, I, I kind of give up sometimes and Shannon's like, no, no, that's a great idea. Like, I think this could really work. So um, yeah, I think that's kind of how it, how do, is that how it works for you, Shannon? Yeah, I think so. I think it like, you get excited about certain work, but it doesn't always make sense with where the direction travels. And I guess that's the good and the bad thing about, you know, letting the art dictate how you how you move, right? That back and forth dialogue. There are definitely a few artists that um, whose work I haven't forgotten about that we've gone to see that I hope we can curate in a different context. It just wasn't kind of the right moment, the right relationship, but to to what Trevor's saying about a third project, like will it be the third project or I don't know. Like I I always find like with certain artists, I don't forget. Like there's someone's like, I'm gonna work with you. I just don't know how it's gonna work yet, right? I need the right context so that you we can do your work justice, right? It's definitely about that. So it might there might so there's the seeds always for the next projects along the way. Um, just hard to predict where they'll come into play. Oh. oh no. <laughs> We've lost our moderator. Oh, Jay, can I ask you Let's... some questions? <laughs> no, I can look in the chat. There she oh. is. <laughs> You're back. Sorry, sorry about that. I don't know what happened, but here I am. Technology. You left us. Technology. 
No, I'm so sorry. I missed you. Um, but you were talking about a third project. So I think that bounces into um, our next question, which was, um, it was noticed on your website that you have a third project called Book Club. How is that part of your curatorial practice? Can you give us an example of how it works? What's the best book you've read lately? Do you want me to feel that so, one? You can tell, I wanted to, can I talk about the best book we've read? Sure. But you can, yeah, you, you, why don't you talk about how book club happened? Because yeah. it's foggy for me. I think, I think we started, I think literature has always been part of our curatorial process just naturally. Um, we, I think the first book we read together was Virginia Woolf's The Lighthouse. I read it a second time. You thought maybe, I think you thought maybe you'd read it or hadn't, you know, read it in earnest. And I was like, oh, let's read it together. And that was like, even before we had conceived fully um, the closer together things are. And so we just started doing it naturally. Um, I think my contribution to this poster was Tom McCarthy's The Remainder. So that I was like, Jay, you gotta read this book. I love this book. It's so great. It really fits with our theme. So then, you know, and then Jay would recommend a book. So it just sort of started evolving from that. And then we made it kind of like, we're gonna be a two person book club and we're just gonna read books together. And, um, but more than that, it we, so we fell into it kind of naturally and I think we're up to what like a lot of books I don't know 75 we're books near, oh no we're oh. sorry we're more than that yeah we're a lot we've yeah. read a lot of books so we've been you know so we just that's pretty much we just read books together now I mean we sometimes go off on our own tangents and, and read things but um so it's also this like back and forth about what we're willing where our interests lie and what we want each other to read Sometimes it's random. Sometimes one book informs the next choice, but it's a way to keep to keep us connected and to keep having discussions. And it's just sort of it it just helps to grow our interest in literature and have a shared foundation. Like now we have we've read the same like almost hundred books. Like that's a real foundation to grow on. So it, it got to a number of books that we thought we should just start. Like now that we have a website, we should start actually like documenting all these books because it's a project now. It's a real um, curatorial endeavor that that shapes how we think. We're often referring back to books, and yeah. There's our so website. So if you look on our website, I'm getting some feedback now. Can you, you can hear me okay? Um, uh, if you look on our website, there's the book club listing, so all the books are there. I would say the best book that we've read was the surprise book, which was George Saunders' um, a, swim in a, a, swim in the pond, a Swim in a Pond in the Rain. What do you think, Shannon? Is that okay to yeah. say that? Awesome book. It's Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sound like a total academic here, and I'm so not, but it's about, uh, it's this guy, this writer, he's a prof somewhere, and he basically, uh, he makes you read um, Russian literature. So um, I'm trying, I should, I don't, why do I not have it in front of me? I don't have it in front of me. But you read like four or five uh, Rus uh, Russian literature stories, which was really weird to read at this time with the things that are going on in Ukraine. But he makes you read the story and then it's like you're in his classroom. He takes you through it and vivisects it and tells you why it's important. So I know that sounds dry, but he is such an interesting writer so fun, keeps you off balance. It's about 700 pages and I was riveted and I totally didn't expect that. And Shannon and her were like, how far are you through the, the Saunders book? And we're like, oh my God, it's so great. So very surprising. And I recommend it to everyone. It's a really great read. So Jay and Shannon, um, you obviously spend a lot of time together and maybe that is why this next question is important. So why collaborate as curators and what makes it work, but also what are the challenges? Uh, I think what, I mean, I think there's a lot of reasons to collab. I mean, I think to collaborate in general, for me, it's really helpful as an independent curator when you don't have, you know, an office full of people to talk to. It's nice to have another curator, you know, to 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 bounce ideas off of and and to talk things through. 
And um, I mean, I think in general, collaborations can be helpful, whether you're an artist or in any field, having that, having that interactive dialogue, uh, I think can only strengthen your work, but it's about who you're collaborating with. It doesn't always go that way. So for me, um, it's super motivating to work with someone like Jay. He makes me think about things in a way that I probably wouldn't think about. It's just, you know, we're, we're, we have similar similarities, but we think about things very differently too. So um, it tests is a sort of a, a place to test my ideas. And I think I'm a much better curator having Jay, like working with Jay as I think we, we support each other and we're able to, I think it just works well. Mm -hmm. We also, we travel together. That's, you know, you have to actually be around this person, but our, also our skill set does this. Like Shannon's the writer to, is a little more detail oriented, takes care of shipping, things I don't like doing. <laughs> and I'm the, you know, I've got, um, it's just a great writer. So uh, I, I'm the, you know, I like to like, you know, the artist in me likes to be conceptual and I like to design things. And um, I don't know, I've learned a lot from Shannon. She's like, uh, you know, she's a curator before I was. So um, it's been a real joy for me to uh, learn patience, actually. I tend to be impatient and I'll drop something and think, ah, and Shannon's always there to like keep motivating me as well. So we motivate each other in different ways. The hard parts are, I don't know. The other thing is we both can come at things. So for grants or uh, like there's two of us, like we can pool our resources. I'm trying to think of what are the challenges, Shannon? Um, traveling together? A coffee machine that doesn't work. There are no challenges as long as I have my coffee. So. There you go. <laughs> I don't know what are the, the challenges. That's a uh, interesting. Like um, I don't know. I think I think we work together because we like to collaborate. You know, like I really enjoy that process. I love I love giving up my idea. I love uh, my idea changing because Shen's got a better one and vice yes. versa like same right yeah, it's like, I think you have to I don't think a collaboration works unless you're willing to have that give and take like I'm okay with I don't get offended if I'm really excited about something and Jay goes yeah right you have to be able to you know it does it nicely but he's like yeah I'm not that into it right and I have to be okay with it I was like okay well and sometimes I'll push back right like you have to be able to to do that um and i don't i don't know i think we we just happen to get really lucky that we can work well together because I, I don't know collaborations can be awful right so mm -hmm. yeah collaborations in general can have lots of challenges so far we're okay <laughs> we're pretty good great thank you for sharing that um we have one final question so in regards to the further part thing seem, Eric Bulmers of the Calgary Herald said, it seems to it seems a touch open-ended and vague. Do you have a response to that? <laughs> How about thanks? I'm good with that. I, I you know, I don't I would I when I see a show that's curated well, I, I don't I don't want to be told what to think um i don't like to be told what to think anyway like just in everyday life um but i think you know shannon and i work really hard at not making obvious connections so the way the further apart thing seems seem goes all the artists approach that topic in very different ways and they and the way they think about that or the the commonality in that is that they they um, talk about it in their own language, like their own visual language. And, you know, I think curatorially, just like making art, I, I always say to my students, like, you know, you want to put something out in the world that you've never seen before that teaches you something. So the process of curation for me is always meeting the artists, like uh, hearing the way they think about things. Uh, being privileged to be around the work and hear that voice. And basically our job is to show that voice. So I'm okay that it's vague. I don't want to tie it up with a bow. I, I just, 
Uh, I think I think that's a strength for it to be vague. It's like a, you know, when you read a not when you read a book, if the if the author spells it out, you don't have any room for your own um, interpretation or corollary or anything. So yeah, it's nice, I, I think, to do that. I would that. say though that we're not vague about why we choose what we choose. There's a lot of decision making that goes into it, and a lot of discussion. Um, but we don't always like, like Jay said, we leave space. So it's not, it's not vague from its conception. It's, it's, we leave a bit of openness and I'm not so sure that it comes across as vague necessarily is, um, not prescriptive, right. That we, we try to leave a lot of space for interpretation and how things can work together. Um, it, there's a lot of layers happening in between that we know are there and you have a lot of different access points as a viewer to making those connections and we we don't try to spell them out very deliberately and to be fair er, in context i think eric was talking about the fact that the work in the show is so disparate mm -hmm. right that it, it doesn't look the same as you walk through it's like oh there you know there's a lot of big sculpture in it so you, you're like oh flat and then colorful and then dark and then video like so yes it is quite eclectic that way but I think um, that's purposeful very much so yeah. mm. great thank you um, if there are no final comments the panel will be I guess ending and I just want to encourage everybody to come into contemporary Calgary we do have the show running until May 22nd um, memberships are only $20 for the year. You can check out everything, but yeah, definitely come down to Contemporary Calgary. Thank you so much, Jay and Shannon. If you have any final comments, feel free to say them. If not, we can say goodbye to our lovely audience. Thank you everyone for coming. Yeah, thank, yeah, thank you very much. It was a real treat. All right, thanks everyone.